Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld. This week, uh, Eric Wright talked about using Terraform and the cloud and a whole bunch of ways that he integrates it into processes um, for Turbonomic. Uh, and he's written a book about Terraform, so he knows his stuff. Um, what we've done is we've taken the lunch and learn part and moved it to the front, so you'll hear the session first. If you want to hear our chit chat, which is actually pretty interesting, we talk about automation chaining and some other interesting topics, that's at the end. Uh, enjoy the show. I hope you come next week to the Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, with no further ado, Eric, please all right. yourself and let's roll. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, it's funny. I just realized I'm like, I didn't even have my name on the slide because I actually don't matter to most of this stuff. I'm just the... <laughs> I'm, I'm just the guy that's been tripping over these things so that you don't have to. That's uh, my goal. I was very that, proud, that actually. Is, that is lunch and learn in a nutshell, right? That's the whole, <laughs> that's the whole goal. So the goal today is to talk about infrastructure as code with HashiCorp Terraform. Uh, my name is Eric Wright. I'm otherwise known as Disco Posse. Uh, easiest to find online using that. Uh, uh, so it's Disco Posse on Twitter. Uh, also a podcaster, a Disco Posse podcast. I'm very proud to have had Rob on my podcast a, a, a number of times and hopefully a number more in the future. And also shout out to the latest Shiny podcast. If you haven't already subscribed, get on in. Um, and I kind of put two logos at the bottom just because I want to give a big thanks. Number one, uh, because Rob and the whole team at RackN uh, have been really, really great at supporting such a broad community of open discussion and open ideas. Uh, and kind of like to what we talked about in one of our podcasts, I called it uh, open source, closed mind. You know, it's very much counter to that. We are very open to discussions, yeah. understanding, especially the enterprise impact of things. Uh, and Rapid Matter is my little sort of fun side project, which who knows where that may end up going. But uh, the idea of connecting and empowering people in a way in which we can, you know, do that better uh, across communities and, and you know, at any rate, you know, this is the goal today was to talk about my experiences as I look across my own environments that I've provisioned and built with this and as well as, as other, you know, customer environments and folks in the community. Really, I, I wanted to use these to a very, in a fun way to describe what I see all the time is this shift away from getting away from, you know, when I talked originally about automation, automation was kind of like scripting out your, your deploys. And we had this idea and, and then all of a sudden somebody explained to me what, you know, idempotent, you know, ideas and idempotent, whatever, however you want to describe it or, or say it. I'm Canadian, so I say it weird. I'm, I say everything weird. <laughs> but the idea that if you run something twice, you know, I've got, I had amazing mm. power CLI scripts and I would run it and I would be like, you're like a hero. You're standing on your desk like, oh, captain, my captain. And then you'd say, oh, something went weird. Run it again. Like, no, no, no. Oh, Jesus, whatever you do, don't run it twice. Because like, who knows what's going to happen, right? So there's no understanding of, of state and awareness of state in order to do this. And this is the kind of the, the move towards infrastructure as code is really codifying that infrastructure for the purposes of automation and then documentation. And I'd say automation is the first thing. The documentation is the bonus because this isn't really how you document your infrastructure. It's, it's how you codify it, you know? And also the other thing, I would go to all these different companies and they would say like, you know, Hey, I automate everything. Like, yeah, that's great. That's cute. Let me see how you automate everything. Let me show you all the, how do you, you launch your scripts manually, you know? And, and you'd have this like network operation center that would run stuff like to in response to things. So it wasn't really, automating everything and I knew this because and I had to take advantage of the fact that there was a new you know laughing Jordan meme uh, because it goes well with with the original Jordan meme about people that have tried to automate everything and realizing kind of like what what Rob was talking about and we, we get into in the discussion of automation chaining and really where are these sort of handoffs in between things and focusing on what you can do particularly well with one platform to service one function as part of a greater you know, sort of flow of, of infrastructure automation. And like, this is, this is it. This is hashtag goals. You know, I, I want to, I want to be thin. I want to be fit and I want to do follow this, this beautiful cycle. But we kind of know the reality is that 
there's kind of like we're, we're good at the, at the coding and building, you know, we're really not so good at the planning part testing. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, but you think about in the true sense of software development, why couldn't we do this in, in infrastructure management? So what I wanted to focus on really was the idea that what can I do better around code, build, test, release, deploy, right? What, so this is where the Terraform bits came into place. And then when I get into operation measure, I'm going to give a quick little sort of view of, of the integration with my team at Turbonomic and how we've actually kind of participated in interacting with automation. And it actually talks about that automation chaining. And the other one, of course, is like, Look, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about what is or isn't DevOps, what is or isn't infrastructure automation, what is or isn't agile ops. Like I'm not I'm not I'm really not going to subscribe to the this dogmatic approach to anything. It's really more like what are you doing that's mm. moving towards this model, but you never arrive and you're never right or wrong. I used to get into these discussions sometimes and people would argue about kind of who's more agile than the other team, right? <laughs> you know, or I went to a development team. I had a development team that I supported and I said, hey, I'm off, I fully automated your application build. And they're like, that's great, you know, uh, but we actually already, already did that for our development environment. So I was like, oh, cool. Well, I, I did it so that we can actually do it across development, UAT and production. They're like, well, no, we're just going to use this for development. You can do it for the other environments. Uh. Like I, I'm, they said, we're already DevOps. I'm like, I, I actually don't think you know what DevOps is then. <laughs> so very seldom do I want to get into the argument over the level level of agileness or or whatever the the thing is yeah, so terraform is really slick for me because it allowed me to kind of solve a very specific set of problems that i always run into which is quickly standing up environments that are across different clouds or on Program. So I'm using VMware a lot. I'm using Azure. I'm using AWS. Uh, you know, I dabble around in a lot of different ways of using the open source side. So open source was great, free, use it, love it, until you have to add a second person to it, right? And then all of a sudden you had problems of making this central portal. And so they need to have TerraGrunt and all these other sort of plugins you could do. So what I did was I, I waited, you know, and I kind of like waited and waited, waited until I could get Terraform Enterprise, which is actually like, I, I say it's a nominal cost. Look, I don't work for HashiCorp, uh, but I, I do endorse that they have a platform that you can probably get value from and you should investigate whether the enterprise option is the way to go. I mean, you know, I won't talk about pricing, but it's, it's nominal compared to, you know, some other products that you may buy. But the cloud side is free. And that, that happened recently. And I think because they found so many people were using Terraform they OSS, like the CLI, that it was really hard for them to port them to Terraform Enterprise. So if you give them Terraform Cloud, which was a central cloud managed portal that gives you shared state, it gives you some of those things, right? And, and that's really the big key is that shared state being continuously updated. So if I make a change and something happens in the environment, which happens more than it should, especially in the cloud, or if you're running VMware and it understands placement, those machines move around all the time. So that state can be like bi-directionally updated. And that was the, the kind of big win for me. And also the fact that it had things like I could tie it to a version control system. So I'm using GitHub. I've got GitLab as well. Uh, if you want to use Bitbucket, I think they also do Azure DevOps. And really the goal for me was infrastructure is code for more than just me. You know, I wasn't just trying to replace the scripts that I was using. I wanted to actually replace the way that my team behaved and interacted and so this was a huge win in the way that I thought that I could, I could use this, this product. And I'll, I'll quickly go in and I'll actually, I'm gonna switch over because I wanna show you, you know, what it looks like and how I've used it very quickly. And then I'll get you to the use case and, and how this played out. So I have Terraform. So if you log in, you know, this is actually a Terraform Enterprise. It's precisely the same as Terraform Cloud, but there's like two or three functions that are not there. And also there's just, I think it's like a 10 user limit, uh, but still there's a, there's a lot of stuff you can do. So I've got my workspace set up and it's actually, today it's actually shut down because I was uh, leaving a cloud environment running for no particular reason. <laughs> But what I can do here is that I could go in and very easily describe the environment. And I had the bonus of, hey, look, I'm, 
I don't want to run a continuous vault environment for this small set of use cases I've got between a subset of teams. So like mm -hmm. I have the ability to do some basic secret management related to Terraform. So this is kind of cool that I could actually have that and I don't have to worry about sharing, you know, my credentials between teams. I can store the, uh, the, the SSH keys. I can do all, all these things within the platform. And then what was really neat was, so this is a basic configuration. Uh, I could actually point you to the code, but it's, it's fairly, you know, easy to imagine what it is. It's deploying a couple of machines. I can actually set it up. So it deploys, this was like building a VPC, sets up a, uh, a certificate, sets up a machine, puts a DNS, puts a load balancer in front of it and fully deploys this, this Turbonomic instance. And then from there, what it would do was I had this ability where I have, I've set this variable called Turbonomic instance size. So in my configuration, I've actually set it to use the, the environment variable to pull the sizing of the instance. And so in my Turbonomic instance, when I detect that I need to scale up or scale down or make changes to the environment, I have Turbonomic talk to this API and update this configuration. And then I've got it because it's backed by a version control system. I then have Turbo make a, a quick little update. It's basically like a, a, a little trigger file in my version control and that forces the plan and apply. And so I have it set to automatically apply so the cool thing is then I literally have this, this beautiful automation chaining where I've got deploy with, ter with Terraform. It operates if I need to scale as I need, then I can you let Turbo do its automation, which is operational optimization, cost optimization, et cetera. And then so I'm, I'm hitting that performance and cost target in that automation area and then making sure that Terraform knows what the hell is going on so that it's continuously up to date on what's happening. So it was a neat way to, you know, kind of Rob, what you talked about, this idea of where the handoffs and the chains are and doing it in a way that you have to be careful, right? Like what's the right way to interact with this system in order to make sure that we're, we're doing it in a way that's not too much of a Rube Goldberg machine. And, and sadly, you know, it's very easy to get into that, that situation. I I mean, in, in this case, what you this these are configuration inputs, and then is does Terraform run the does this this run the Terraform plans for you? Or yeah, you so run it's the plans. You can you can either run them or I actually because of the way that that if you're there are way yeah, this is here you go kids this is how you find there's actually a whole lot of Rube Goldberg behind every good automation. Yeah. In order to get it to do a plan and apply. I need to set the, like create a, a and this is how, I'm not a developer. So you, you'll, you'll very quickly find out how horrifying it is that I'm actually running infrastructure at scale. <laughs> but the, so basically you had to like instantiate a state of the current environment through the API and then interact with that state to force a, but you have to write it to a location and store that, and I was like, there's all these, like, I was going through the docs and I was like 17 tabs deep until I was eventually at the same tab again. And I, I was like, I've talked to my friend who works there. And I was like, dude, how do you do this? Like, I don't understand how to, how to trigger this. And he's like, whew, yeah, good luck. Like I explained the use case and he's like, and then I realized, I'm like, wait a second. If I look at the way that this is set up, I, I have it so that my version control I just set it so that it's always triggers on a run. And so it's automatic or I can even set it as a plan. And so all I did was instead of trying to interact with this API, I set it to interact with GitHub. So all I did was I grab a trigger file, which I set in my repository and my turbo instance just goes and it, it, it basically bumps the version on that file, which forces because of the VCS connection to trigger the Terraform plan. And because I've got it set to auto apply, it just goes all the way through the system. So th there is, there is the interesting, you know, connections that's, in the way that you have to pull that together. That's GitOps. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, the, the side effect could be, and I've seen Terraform do this, right? It, you might have changed the size of your, you know, the size of one of your instances and it says, oh, the sizes don't match. And then it deletes them 
and recreates them with the new size, right? It's right. Yeah. Well, and this is the interesting thing. Be, your mileage varies on the behaviors when you make certain state changes, right? So in this exactly, case, yeah. if I'm changing again, yeah, instant size, it destroys and recreates it. So you, you have to tread carefully. And it was funny that if I look at like kind of this was the, the flow that we've bumped into and, and what kind of this is kind of the enterprise flow. And we talk about how we tied things in together. We've got teams that are, that have got like application, you know, frameworks that are ultimately are then being monitored by different, you know, sets of APM tools, whether it's open source or, or proprietary and, and, and uh, enterprise tools. So we're getting all that instrumentation about performance. And then you had this neat extra layer where they have on the bottom, all their DevOps teams are, are moving stuff, whether it's you know, CI CD builds, they're doing automated builds, automated deploys, and then they're looking for, well, where do I place for like performance, capacity, uh, cost, et cetera. So we actually had the ability now to take that and, and actually interact with that. Again, sort of using those loosely coupled interaction points where, in Terraform, I'm updating environment and configuration variables. In Kubernetes, I can actually update YAML. In, in build automation, I can update configuration in, in the pipeline so that we know we can start to see those different bi-directional points. And it's a neat way that you can you can interact with those systems. But the value for me with Terraform and every environment I've I've helped out with is always that, you know, you want to change the way you operate. When you start to have to codify your builds, you really change the way you think about stuff. And then you start to hate the way you did it before, which is so beautiful. <laughs> you know, and, and Rob, like you, you kind of know that, that pain point that like ops teams have a, a disturbingly high pain tolerance. And it's kind of, it kind of goes across three different things. Now one, right? Like it's like how to make sure that the team how, do this, how does the team work? And if I'm going to build collaborative platforms, do, does the team actually collaborate? So making sure that they can now you know, work in shared projects and do things like that. And I look at, at where those, those interaction points are. And for folks that know about Conway's law, right? we build systems that will emulate the commu communication patterns of an organization. So if you want a microservices approach, you better have micro teams, right? That's why you do it. If, you're, if you have a monolithic development team that's trying to build microservices, you're about to find out how behavioral psychology works because it, it's not going to fly the way that you imagine it will. And, and in fact, maybe you don't, you know, there's the, I was like David Hanemeyer Hansen and Jason Freed have this beautiful post, which I still refer to all the time. It's called the, the majestic monolith, right? Basecamp is a, is a huge single monolithic application that supports millions of requests a month. And they're like, why would I need to break it out into subservices? Works for them, right? So, so your mileage may vary. But again, that's an important, that's an important point. Yeah. Sharing source code. So now that not just codifying for your own purposes, but moving to this idea of shared source code, uh, I should say like asterisk, right? Be careful. Like minor secret management. It's not not fully fledged. Um, so, uh, but it is. You know, it meets the basic requirements, and it sure is better than than jamming your secrets into a YAML file somewhere, which is inevitably where they're sitting right now or in a text file. Yeah. The triggers and gates, right? So making sure that in order to move to full automation, we see this even today where like ServiceNow had workflows to be able to like pause and stop and wait for approvals and you know, whatever your, your gating method is, make sure that all of the things you do respect those gates and triggers, but you know, be careful. Every interaction point is a risk because what if state changes twice before a trigger is actually met, you know, and will it understandably, you know, maintain state between these triggers and gates as, as we go. But the beauty part is like, what are the, the top things that I do? And, and wait, wait, the, you skipped over testing and monitoring. <laughs> That's because nobody does that. So, and, and the, <laughs> So when I look at this one, my questions are. yeah, yeah. And this is why I, I, I kind of wanted to pull it here because <laughs> when you get into the tech, this is the first place you go is like, what's the monitor you use? But this is the important point is why do you do it? Uh, so 
you, the first thing we do is said, how do I monitor it with Splunk? Or how do I monitor it with Prometheus? How do I like, well, hold on a second. What's the actual function of your monitoring? Right. And, and as a, as a, a guy who has to evangelize a product all the time that say like, Oh, you guys are a monitoring tool. I'm like, no, we're an automation and optimization platform that happens to do monitoring in order to do so. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what we do if, with our monitoring is different than what a Splunk would do or what a, a solar winds would do or, or Prometheus, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, that's, testing that's and monitoring, an point. Yeah. this is really interesting because you have to think like you have to understand the function and purpose of these things. So you're doing Prometheus to grab application layer metrics and, and some infrastructure layer metrics, you know, and is there a single open tool that can do this particularly well? Oh God, I wish there was. And there probably was, there was, there actually was. And I, I'm going to pour one out for Snap, right? Intel Snap had such a fantastic way to do this, <laughs> you know, except that we realized that it was painful to bring in cross community collaboration and agreement on, you know, it was, it was like an RFC for monitoring, like, and all it was, then you realize why network standards are also still called RFCs. They're not standards they're still waiting for continuous comment. <laughs> and so this is where the, the, so for me, right, what does that workflow look like? So my code repo, easy. Yeah, GitLab or GitHub, uh, build and deployment tooling. I've, I'm pretty rudimentary still myself because I'm not doing a lot of like application ground up builds. So me, it's more like I'm using Travis and Jenkins to do kind of rudimentary deploys. So I'm not a super advanced case. The monitoring and usage, yeah, this is where the fun comes in. I'm using a, a variety of different tools. Prometheus, I'm dabbling a lot more with. Uh, starting to dig into, you know, kind of the observability toolkits more uh, and, and looking for, you know, what are the right things to monitor and, and keep track of the health of the, the state of the environment. No, not just like operationally, uh, you know, and then of course, like my, you know, my shameless plug is, is my companies in the business of, of doing structure and, and application optimization, but everything, you know, has to be part of this, like it's about the loop of feedback back into these systems. So that making sure that it's where you can try and make these be self feeding and this automation chaining. So there you go. I've officially co-opted and stolen yeah. your, your phrase, <laughs> but uh, it makes sense, right? Because that, that is truly for me, what I think of as the, the panacea or as close to a panacea as I can get. And, uh, you know, I think that the problem is that more single panes of glass are more like Pangea than panacea. They are really cool single <laughs> things that will eventually split off and become separate continents. <laughs> I, the, my, my issue is that they end up being reading tools, right? Single pane of glass usually implies read. Right. And what, the place where all this stuff breaks down to me is in control. Exactly. So, so, right. That's if you're, if you're doing automation chaining, which I think is really important, then you have to have a place that you can accumulate state bidirectionally, which a lot of these tools don't do very well. Um, uh, you know, like Terraform is really good about storing its state, but it's not particularly good about sharing. It. It's not a source of state. So there's no, you know, as far as, unless they've really changed something in enter, enterprise, they're, they're not making an API available that you say, that you can go in and say, huh, how many servers do I have up in this? And what's their configuration? And, and you know, what's, what's going on? Because then you could, you know, chain together. I mean, this is exactly what we, we found with Digital Rebar and what we build with Rebar um, is that you end up with this state store and the state store knows what's going on and then it's you know the automation chaining idea is then you can tell terraform hey go build some stuff and tell me what you did and then i'll i'll store that for you um but you don't want to interfere with terraform doing its job well right yeah and that's and why those true. those interaction points are like key it's funny I, it suddenly just hit me i'm like we, we should it's almost like a, a, a an automation republic uh where e each individual platform has its own understanding of state but we have to have some kind of of common view and common ways to interact with those various states somebody somebody i was talking to was describing them as automation islands yeah 
And so like I, I was like, and chain is not necessarily my favorite word. Um, and we, we started going towards like uh, automation bridges, but it wasn't as immediately visible to people, visceral to people. Like, so like I imagine all these castles with moats, like every, every platform is this, you know, castle in a moat. And, you know, they want to all like, you know, you know, gr growl at each other and, and, you know, fire the cannons. Um, and, and, you know, you're just showing up and you're like, um, we just want to build a bridge, get into your castle, work with you, you know, not threatening. And then we're going to, we're going to leave with the plan <laughs> yeah. you know, with, with some stuff. And then we're going to help you trade. It's like merchants, you know, um, automation merchant. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think, so I guess I should, I should probably give a, a quick wrap on why, why I talk so bloody much about Terraform. Yeah. And that's really because for me, it solved the most fundamental problems that I had with the most common use cases that I bumped into. Hmm. And it's, and I think of the, the way that, I want to eliminate my fault, right? And I, we, I, we use this phrase in the, this product I'm talking about today. It's, it's called mean time to not my problem, right? Like get, make it not, not my issue. I love it. So if I can, if I can eliminate, you know, and I used to do this, I was so, it was super selfish, right? When I was running data center ops, I'm like, I don't want to, I want people to think that I do a lot more than I do. And I really was all about automating these build flows and, and doing the stuff because I wanted it to, to, they knew how bad it sucked. And then I could automate the suck so that they still thought it, it was as difficult and as onerous and as time consuming, but I could then sort of like use that time in order to do other proactive things yeah. Cause they still thought it took me uh, three days to stand up a new host or, or a new cluster or, or whatever it was. So I would still use that time. You know, it's, it was an interesting tactic for me. And then, you know, once you kind of, cause once you open the door and you tell them that it, I can get this done in 17 minutes, they're like, perfect. At minute 18, give me a call. Cause I got your next task ready. I'm like, <laughs> so it's it was so first it was like can i validate and do the thing that i do so that it's not i right pain free for me and then can i re, can i then reduce the pain for the next stage so who do i interact with next what's the handoff point and then going through so for me being an ops architect like standing up new infrastructure quickly you know, I was always iterating on builds. So it was like, how do I very rapidly stand up a brand new VPC, stand up a bunch of machines? So I build, we build classroom environments for, for Turbonomic. That's how we do our classroom training. We stand it up in the cloud right. and we used to have to, they would like build them and then carve them out and they interact with them through SSH and then they set out the configuration. So I worked with our education team and in the course of two days of mucking about with, with Terraform, we got to the point where the whole thing, it's, you know, how many, how many classrooms in, do you need? How many students in each classroom? Right. Done. And that was it. Like just spin it up, provision, tear down. And it was very specific. Again, we tear well, it ter down. That's, well, that's where Terraform is awesome, right? Yeah. To me, that is, that is you know, short-lived infrastructure. You know, it's, it's really not a production use case. It's, it's great. The thing that I always scratch my head on where state really matters is what day two looks like. Right. Right. You know, and that's, that I think is, you know, you hinted at this and I think it's an important thing is, is how do I take an infrastructure's code tool that can interact with all these APIs and then take something that is running has state um, and then make a, a change to that state confidently. Right. Um, and Terraform to me doesn't, um, address that question because the state files are opaque. I can't like peek in and say, oh, look, here's the stuff I have running and figure that out. I have to go to a Turbonomic and say, tell me what I've got running, please, before I go and, you know, tear down something. That I well, the, tear down. yeah, and, and I guess it's, it's interesting the, 
you in a way you can through the state file like it does it does have a, a surprising amount of data in there uh, mm -hmm. let me actually yeah. I'll, just, I'll jump in just real quick to show you kind of like the the view along the along the ride of of what state looked like as we went through and that's what i liked about the cloud side was that it actually version controls your state so mm -hmm. if you if somebody made a mistake or did a thing I can, so I had it, if I run it personally, or I've got like four different instances that were targeting my environment. So I can see every time somebody took an action and interacted via Terraform. And so what'll happen is it has that whole state file and it understands, you know, what were the changes that occurred in, in that particular state file as, as we took it, uh, or at least at, at certain points along the way, I could go into the active state and and I could pull a certain amount of information, but what you didn't necessarily know was, yeah, if I make a change to like, you know, to a VM to add virtual memory, will it power it off and power it back on? Sometimes you you had to kind of wing it and see if it was going to do it. <laughs> so that's why the same flow through environments was important because if you how does your development environment need to behave? How does your test environment need to behave? They're much more, uh, you know, ad hoc. They're much more short lived. But then, like you said, production, I did have to do this. And we've, we've got situations where we've got Terraform, you can muck around with it. You can get inside the bits to kind of like block it from managing certain pieces of state so that it won't trigger redeploys and stuff like that and i i'm always careful with stuff like that i i'm the my the the greatest word in the english language to me is default like i just what's what just works and can i map my processes to leverage the value of the default and so one customer that i was working with and they're just like yeah we had to do some kind of neat back end heavy lifting to make sure that terraform's not monitoring memory because if it if we change the memory in turbo it would ch it would look different in the state and then when it runs it destroys the instance and redeploys it so they need they basically went in and and told it to stop tracking states so you can actually go in and muck around and it's probably not even that difficult but for me again two problems right fundamentally lazy not a programmer so I don't want to be really good at breaking open the the skull of this thing and figuring out how it works. Mm. I kind of work backwards and say, how do I know it, how it works? And does my process align with that? And if it doesn't, then maybe is it the right tool? So it's, it is an interesting thing of, you know, mileage variance based on use case and, and operator style. That's really cool though. But it is, so it is handy. And, and, and so that was the cool thing as I, you know, somebody says like, Hey, you know, what happened at a particular time? And, and I was able to go in and like, Oh, look at that. Right. If I size it up, then, you know, when does it size up, size down and, and people can see whether it was a developer that made a change. Cause every time I would do a trigger to the GitHub, it would go in and trigger the, the deploy. So there were, it was easy to spot when I, I was, when I do things on the fly. And it was, it was kind of neat. It was funny because I would do the change in this demo environment as I was showing people this. And by the time you like get from one screen to the other, it would, it would be like running a plan and apply. <laughs> it's like, sometimes you got to move really fast in between stages because you would, you would see these changes occurring. And so, uh, but that's what I taught myself and what I teach people too is like, what can't, where can you let that occur? Like, that's the goal is what can I do that I know that I can confidently automate. And that's the confidence in automation is the trust in the outcome, which is really the goal, right? Automation is velocity is a side effect. Velocity with consistency of outcome is what I really care about you know, happening fast. If dumb things happen faster, that's not good automation. And that's effectively what a lot of automated tools are doing. Oh, so yeah. it's, you know, anyways, I could, no, I got nice. a whole diatribe about consistency of outcome and, and, you know, automating bad practices, but, you know, so in, so that's my, so my framing of why Terraform's neat to me is the specifics of the use cases that I could hammer out really quickly that I solved quickly. Uh, and then, like I said, doing application builds, I use Terraform and then I do a handoff to Ansible. 
And then I carefully, you know, look for what's the continuous state now that I have two tools operating that platform, you know, so <laughs> you do have to be careful about some of those things. Yeah. No, that's a interesting challenge from that. It got bad one time where I, I was actually, I was at an event and someone's like, how long have you been working for HashiCorp? I'm like, God damn it. I don't <laughs> like, you, you wrote a friggin' book. I know exactly. The, uh, but the cool thing was because I wanted to, I wanted to like solve, and this is like the, the neat thing is I was at an AWS, the AWS summit talking about Terraform for cloud. And, and it was kind of funny to be there and have like literally a standing room only group. They had, a, they did dev talks, which was so cool. It was the first time they opened up to, to the community to have community speakers mm -hmm. at an AWS event, which was very difficult to have them do, you know, in the past, they, they were, they are very sort of like, they want to have a very curated kind of message and experience and, and rightly so. Yeah. And so this was cool to be a part of the first event that did it. And what, what the people that were there loved was that when you talk about the value of this thing, it made them look and say, ah, okay, cool. So like you're not replacing cloud formation in every use case, you're not replacing, you know, all these other services, but out of all those people, it had like 10 to 15 people stay after for like about an hour. We all just had this kind of like huddle to talk about what we've experienced, where it sucked, you know, how we got through it. And that really became the thing of why, you know, you know, rebar and your community and, and other communities we've been a part of, like, that's the real fun is, where does the where does the platform unlock the pain for people, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Hey, Sherry has a question, by the way. I like All right. your point. Go ahead, Sherry. So um thank you. This is awesome as as always. Um if we go two or three steps down the, the chain, and we know that my passion is security and automation of those kinds of things. And if I'm an auditor coming in to take a look, to be able to tie this back to your SOC or your ISO or anything else that you, you've got happening, where are the, where are the things that could trip us up? Ah, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's an interesting question. And so I will tread carefully as I am not an employee of HashiCorp, only a friend of, <laughs> uh, <laughs> If I think about a common, so going back to my ops days, getting audited a disturbing amount of times, which is right, you know, proud provider of, of yes, it care is. carefully audited. <laughs> At least once a year. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I ran financial services and insurance environments. So I, I, I knew about all sorts of exciting regulations that I had to meet, especially in Canadian, in you know, both provincial yeah. and federal. Uh, so what you'd have to do, Sherry, is like kind of go back and yeah, could I pick any point at any any time? And if I think, let me just quickly, I'll, again, I'll, I'll jump back in and talk about my understanding of common place that places that I'd have to go. Number one, you know, what's the state of the environment at any point in time? Because they always go to a snapshot. They'll say like on the seventeenth of September. Exactly. You know, who who could have interacted with it at that point in time? And sort of within here, then you're going to be able to see like what's there, uh, who has access to the environment in general. It does not, to the best of my, does not, to my knowledge, keep access controls at points in time, at least like not easily in this view. The mm -hmm. There may be other auditable things that are inside there. So I don't want to, I don't want to speak ill. Uh, or good of of the capabilities there, but at least as far as like state of the environment at a point in time, you can show that which which you know items, which secrets are maintained within this platform, making sure that they aren't exposed. If you try and go in and change that, there is no there is no way to to modify these. You just delete them, you know. So that's it. You can't go back in and and get it. You can only add a new version of it or delete it. You can never go back and get that secret. Uh, so that's a good portion of it. Uh, and then, of course, inside itself, there's going to be the the level of sort of team access that you've got. So there are other controls that are there. And so, again, uh, consult your HashiCorp uh, team you know, to talk about the, the broader level. But at the infrastructure level, what I would get asked all the time is like, yeah, 
what was the state of the environment at, at that point in time? And I can go back, uh, you know, a fairly decent amount and be able to say that, all right, you know, in that time frame seven months ago, this was what the environment looked like. This was who ran it. This is what it looked like at the end. It shows you the logs. So it does have a good amount of easy out of the box capabilities to sort of tie in. And then of course you may have to look at, you know, other logs that are on the AWS side or the vert, the vCenter side, whatever it's going to be. So, so there are some features that are kind of fairly well baked in that are easy to find for me. Uh, but again, I'd, I'm sure the HashiCorp team is probably much more in the regulatory realm that they could talk about. Awesome. That's, that's very cool. Actually, the editor delete would be, is going to be a, is a, uh, an auditor's dream. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, there's, there's literally no reversible encryption to this. It's once you hit a uh, secret and you said apply, that's it. Good luck and may your God go with you. You are on your own. <laughs> so the cool thing is the moment you change that key around, then that's it. Like, cause up to this point, mm -hmm. I'd have to, you know, hand out AWS keys to individual people and they would have to plug it into their own local configuration environment. And who knows how they were protecting it in the local. So this now means that I've got a collaborative platform. Then I can go onto my GitHub side and I can store a lot of secrets in natively in GitHub, like the deployment keys and, and stuff like that as well, and certain variables in there. So very, very cool that you can do much more in these collaborative platforms and yeah, like you said, Sherry, be auditable you know, at a point in time. I had like the funniest audit ever. I had somebody who was like, I, I ran all the directory infrastructure. So I had Active Directory and, and Novell directories and all sorts of crazy stuff. And so they came to me and they said, hey, on this date, I need you to, they just like, eh, thumb in the air, like just grab one. Who does a, uh, you know, who, who was able to access this resource at this time? And we looked and there was somebody in there who was an employee who had been removed but they had come back for like a month for a quick contract. And so we had a deletion notice from them for like six months ago. And then all of a sudden it showed them having full administrative access to this resource. And I was just like, oh dear goodness. So we, we had to go through all these, this rigmarole to prove when they were turned back on and all this crazy stuff because they had gone and taken the snapshot and of all things they pick. Wow. That's, of course. That's cool. Well, yeah, and that's the- Let's, let's pick it up, so. Anyway. Yeah, that's the, that's always, going to be the case, right? The, the one that you don't want um, is the one <laughs> they're going to pick. All right, all. I'm sorry to do it, but the curtain is closing on us for the this Lunch and Learn. Always an amazing discussion. Eric, thank you. Yeah, and anybody who wants to reach out, of course, you know how to get a hold of us. Yes, and Eric did write a book about Terraform, so you, you need to help, you need to buy his book. Uh, it's it's free it's free actually so well, if you well, go to yeah yeah uh, if you go to my website discoposse.com I think I have a link there if not you go to turbonomic.com and, and it's under the resources section it's uh, it was written with O'Reilly so uh, it was pretty pretty fun to be able to, to do that one so a good little getting started with guide for and that's DevOps with Terraform and VMware which is like people are like wait what so yes yeah that's why I've done some uh, a decent amount of stuff with this and everything is way too normal <laughs> <laughs> all right but with that we do need to conclude so thank you everyone i'll see you next week thanks everyone yeah when you're looking at eric and i were just talking about uh team building um and, and hiring teams and managing and stuff like that and, um you, what i what i found is that the language that our team uses doesn't necessarily translate into what the people were hiring are used to so like i'll i'll hire somebody and they're rock stars and they're they're great people and i know they're bringing skills we need to the team and then you know have to figure out what you know what language they they want to talk in to figure out how to how to help them onboard well Right. Instead of asking them to be like, oh yeah, just figure out how to you know work in this team that's been together for years. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, you need us to have more process here. We should have more process here. Let's add more process. Um, you know, that's you know, or or not not expect you to spin twenty plates at the same time, like yeah, like some of us do. Um, 
So, yeah, it's been interesting. I haven't heard from the, uh, I haven't seen Charity be as active of late. Interesting. Maybe I'm just not watching my, no. Might be I'm a feature coming. <laughs> might, be, might be, there's a quiet period going on and they're doing their, their, who knows, uh, who knows who knows that's that's usually when when somebody disappears from social media who's very vocal <laughs> there's a there's a, a, there's a significant event yeah yeah there's an end to the tunnel um yep yep that's it yep there, there you go there's there's the truth for for you in in that um Just make sure I think you and i had a couple of minutes to talk so i'm, I'm rewinding where where we were going um i've got an interesting thing to uh to talk through ah <laughs> uh -huh. uh, good, 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 good there we go there we go um i blew up my flow there i gave away my memes, <laughs> away memes. That's, all, that's all good um we i've been i've been using this phrase and I, i'd love to test it out with you which is um if, uh automation chaining hmm I like, yeah, um, it's because it, it, it makes sense immediately to me in the way that I think about it is the, the sort of the, the, the loosely coupled handoffs between systems, automation systems, because there can be no manager of managers or automator of automators. Uh, so how do you effectively chain them together? And, and that is where the, right. the challenges lie. <laughs> and it's funny kind of, I, I did a, a session about, well, I did a Terraform session with Ansible for the okay. Ansible meetup. And, and I said, it's the funny thing is here, I'm talking about Terraform in the context of Ansible because it's Terraform's like super good at one thing, Ansible not so good at that thing, Ansible super good at other things, terrible, Terraform is terrible at that thing, right? <laughs> so continuous configuration management and in virtual machine and in app stuff, not Ansible, why would yeah. you use terraform for that it just doesn't make sense so i showed kind of the the simple handoffs and then the 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 issues where you've got to be careful because when you use uh as a provider you know even they even mention you know in all the docs and all the folks at, at hashcorp say like be careful with providers because they don't they may hand off variables and some information like secrets but that's it like state between providers is not maintained. State is only maintained in Terraform's understanding of state. And so you have to be careful about those things. So they very much highlight the risks that you create when you have those, those handoffs and where, you know, when you do something that you, you hand off to provider, you're just going to get an exit code back. Not necessarily everything that you would expect to then feed this next part of the process. So that automation chaining is really kind of, where you have to think, you know, standing up the core infrastructure. So I, you know, I rack in, you know, I rebar my cluster. And then from there, then I can, you know, terraform my cloud, you know, resources. And then from there, then I can Ansible my apps. And then from there, then I can salt stack my security. And each of those has those neat distinct handoffs. So it's funny, I didn't, really, yes. I didn't think that salt stack was still a thing until I keep, until all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of vulnerability warnings from all these vendors because there was a salt vulnerability. <laughs> and so all okay. of a sudden V realize is like, Oh, update your V realize. Cause we use salts in order to do our, our application uh, insight stuff. <laughs> I was like, Oh, neato. I know wow. Nutanix had a, had a, had a thing that okay. popped up cause I know they use salt as well. So it's, that's how you find out. It's kind of like the remember heart bleed. Every, mm -hmm. No one thought they were using open source software. They're like, I'm going to use an enterprise firewall because then I can trust that it's proprietary code. <laughs> Got bad news, kid. That proprietary uh, code was built on the backs of the community. Yeah, that's right. That's how that's, we see it. I mean, uh, for us, there's a ton of open source stuff we integrate across. Um, but that's, you know, for us, it's, you're describing the tools. Um, I have an interesting story. Um, and then... For y'all listening, we'll we'll start five, at fifteen after. We'll start the presentation. This is the the this is the preamble. <laughs> um, and yeah, because what we're finding is is that automation chaining isn't just Terraform and Ansible and stuff like that. It's like, oh, I need to get an IP address. I need to you know get a certificate. I need to register a name. I need to 
check in with this, you know, I need to talk to the storage service to, you know, get a, a, a iSCSI LUN or something like that before I, I complete the VMware configuration or whatever sequence of stuff that you need to get done. Um, the stuff you didn't realize was dependent and order bound, which is, uh, you know, God bless all those folks that have lived that pain with Puppet, right? That would, Puppet was fantastic for doing a lot of like, you could just deploy, deploy your whole cluster. But the beauty part is it's different every time because you didn't know the oh. order in which Puppet would execute. <laughs> so it was... Oh, that's, that was the non-deterministic. We, that was one thing that we had to stomp on really. Like we really have order matters a lot. And then the other, the one that Chef would get tripped up on is that... Um, and the Ansible does, no, Ansible doesn't do it any better, is it sometimes cross machine dependencies require blocking. Right. Um, all right. I remember somebody had this basically Redis database called Dozer, like Redis like, but they were using that as a, as a lock to lock, lock, you know, so basically you're like, you're running a chef run or an Ansible run. And then behind the scenes, you have a lock across all <laughs> these, and you don't know that it's locked. It's just built into the thing. And you're like, oh. Lord, help me! You've got invisible locks built into your operations code. That's that's thumbs up. Going to work great. Um, so it's it's like layers of this stuff. Um, good. I'm glad that that phrase that works for you. Some people are like, oh, I hate it, and there's a lot of people who are like, okay, I get it, and then the, they don't want managers of managers, right? Um, or single pane of glass gets violent reactions from people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I agree with that, but. Um, yeah, that I definitely the, use the, the single source of truth. So I've got, so there's an, a new, a new platform launch that I'm in the throes of right now. Cool. And, and, and part of it is that someone said like, it's kind of like one, one place to look at things and said, and that's, be very careful about how you describe that. And so if you say single pane of glass on any materials or any discussions, I will personally come and slap your ears. I'm like, there's no one says single pane of glass on my product. <laughs> I, you know, it's sad to me that, that that term has gotten such maligned, so, so maligned. Um, but because it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable objective, right? I, you want to see what's going on everywhere um yeah what and i think i always use it as like the you know i switch and i say it's the authoritative source for the context of your current view really and that's really what it's like so in the same way that kind of like uh you know instead of of it being like a, a bee's vision with like five thousand you know perfect you know views so you can see the whole world in one spot I think of it more like a walleye lens where you have an intense visibility and magnification on the center of what, of what you're looking at. And then the edges bleed out a bit. And so as you move, so the, and really that, that idea that it's a very focused view. Yeah. However, you know, like how do you, cause there's always going to be interaction with other things, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny, it's funny how like this, the pedantic anger that comes from things like, like I, you're talking to the guy that owns it's on premises.com because I'm so pissed off with people saying <laughs> on premise all the time. So I had to, I, I still that. own the domain. <laughs> I, share, I share your anger. And it's amazing how the, the, the level of, of people and companies that don't get it. Yeah. I want to shout out. My favorite example of that was someone said, just on that. Someone said to me, they said like, you know, I, I said, what's well, it's on, it's on premises. You have to be careful. And they said, well, it's, it's kind of pedantic. You know, really to get hung on that. I said, oh, you're right, Pete. Uh, my name's Joe. Well, you're kind of being pedantic, aren't you? <laughs> you know, like, it, it, is, it does matter. Like, it's actual words. It's actual words now. Yeah, but it's, it's very interesting how it's the, those things. So, yeah, like single pane of glass. I, what I tell you is I can give you a single pane of glass for what matters to you in the context of this view. What I won't sell you is a single pane of glass. I'm not going to unsell the other things that you have to go to every day. You know, and, and it's that's that's where people get really mad, right? Yeah. If if you were to, right, and that's why I, I do like the automation chaining thing, because what you're like, look, I you're not undoing the value proposition of Terraform or Ansible or something like that. What you're doing is you're saying that's a silo, and it doesn't help me to work in the silo. Um, 
Now you might get to a point where you can disable, you know, you can turn off one of those things maybe because they've, you know, they've, they've got a legacy component to it and you can say, you know what, I really don't need, um, you know, Terraform to, or Ansible to do this configuration step. It's a lot of overhead for that, just that one piece of that chain. Right. Um, yeah. And like you said, the, the thing that the next stage that people went for for a while was this like manager of managers. And it's really interesting because you'll see like, um, you know, some of the folks that are, that are dabbling in that space. It's a tough one because the real, the manager of managers is the manager that's the manager of managers that comes with your ELA is really what they're, they're trying to, that's like the VMware's and the Microsoft's of the world. Yeah. They want to own the whole user experience because it has these little pockets. So that's what Tanzu is going to be about, right? Tanzu is a, isn't a platform. It's a, it's a portal into the places where you can buy other things with the Tanzu name really. And rightly so, because if you want, if you want to do, you know, this next thing, you're probably pretty far into that ecosystem. So it makes sense, you know, Cisco with Intersight. It's the idea of giving you 12 beautiful menu options and three of them are, are unlocked, but the rest are there. So, you know, I, I want this to be your, your common portal to have vision, you know, and visibility across your entire environment. And uh, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, UCS sort of did that. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll, reel us in to uh, do schedule. Now, as, as you know, um, I'm gonna cut this so that the presentation is first in the video that I post. Um, and so all the conversation we, we just had will be second. That way people can jump right into the lunch and learn topics. Uh, <laughs> before we go, is anybody, uh, I, everybody should be unmuted in the background so y'all can talk and ask questions. Do you want questions during the presentation? How do you want to do it? Oh, cut me off. Cut me off anytime, especially Wences. I see you on there, my friend. <laughs> Anybody's <laughs> welcome to, uh, to drop in and, and slow me down as needed. Okay. With that, I'm stopping my video. I'm just going to let it run. If you want to keep your video on a speaker, that's cool. Yeah, so you can see the horrifying look on my face as I trip through these slides and demos. So.